All right, welcome to the fifth unit. Uh, this unit is kind of broken into two parts. The first part that we'll get accomplished this week is the Civil War. The second half of Unit 5 is Reconstruction. Uh, today we're going to cover the first three sections on the Civil War. And in your in-person class this week, we will do uh, Section 4, which is all about Lincoln. So we'll save that one for our in-person time. Your schedule for this week is as follows. On Monday, you should watch the lecture video. On Tuesday, there's quite a few readings this week, so I gave you a little extra time. You have Tuesday and you also have Friday as a work day uh, to get those readings done and then start planning out your fourth short paper. Wednesday, we'll have our online class, and Thursday, you have a new assignment. This is going to be to go through a set of documents on the Civil War and answer the questions that follow. Uh, notice that in the assignment, and I'll tell you here, that you can submit a separate document if the uh, table that's put in the document uh, it doesn't fit for your answer. So feel free to do your answers on a separate uh, document and turn that in. That's completely fine. Uh, your Journal 10 and your Unit 5 documents are both due by Friday. That Friday is the last day before break. So make sure you get those submitted by 11.59 on that day. Your fourth paper on Unit 5 isn't due until the Friday after break, but I wanted to make sure to give you more than enough time to look at those questions, really plan out your answer. Some of them you won't be able to choose now, um, but just know that when we get back from break, that week is going to be a heavy week. Uh, we'll be wrapping up Unit 5 since it's very short. And uh, you'll have that short paper due. You'll have an exam that week. So I wanted to make sure that you know what's coming uh, and just use this time to plan it out. Maybe you pick a question and you write the whole thing now. It's not an official assignment over break, but it, it will be due the Friday we come back from Thanksgiving break. All right, that is enough housekeeping. Uh, let's get to where we've got to go. Uh, the first section that we're going to talk about is the background and causes to the Civil War. And this can be quite extensive. Uh, so the first piece that we've got to talk about, the roots of the Civil War go all the way back to the beginning of the nation. It starts in colonial times. It starts with triangular trade. And the reason that it goes back to these roots is that the slave trade was such a large part of triangular trade and because of that the uh, the colonies become dependent on slave labor and that dependency travels through uh, into the United States and will uh, get even more extensive after the industrial boom uh, that we talked about in the last unit with the invention of the cotton gin and that increased dependency to have slaves and to have that labor force because once the cotton gin is produced, uh, we then can fully transition to being to having the cash crop of the South be cotton. And then we see the North becoming a textile heavy industry. And once we start making that money as a nation, it's very hard to get away from it. So the dependency on slavery only increased over time and those roots really came from colonial times uh the real uh the the next piece where we see the root causes come out of that critical period that we talked about the critical period when we're forming the constitution and you see slavery written into the constitution those words of uh all enslaved peoples are non-freed peoples is put into the three-fifths compromise where we acknowledge that uh, slaves are less than uh, because we're not counting them as whole people. So it's kind of this justification from the founding fathers of saying, okay, we recognize that there are slaves and we recognize that they're not, uh, they're not going to be uh, at the, on the same level or acknowledged in the same way as everyone else. 
So this combination of factors from colonial times to the critical period uh, really pushes for the South to become dependent on slavery. And as I mentioned before, once the Southern economy becomes propped up by the institution of slavery, there really is no getting out of it. The South can't see past the money that they're making uh, and see another method of success without slavery. Uh, so they, they really do rely on it. It is the biggest crutch in the South, and that will, that will lead to tensions. That will lead to uh, explicit tensions because when people start attacking the institution of slavery, the Southerners see that as, attack, as an attack on their way of life, their culture. And if you know anything, when you attack somebody's culture or their way of life or their traditions, that is uh, a very sore point that can push people to an uglier conflict. Let's catch up on our politics, though. Uh, we talked a bit about Jackson in the last unit, but Jackson really pushes to change politics, and we're going to see a swift transition here. Uh, Jackson, during his presidency, is going to go to war against the National Bank. Uh, Jackson's supporters were of the South. The Southerners do not favor the bank because they see it as a place uh, for the industrial north to go and get money to become stronger and in all reality the national bank did uh, slightly tip the scales towards business because that's where businesses would go to get their loans if they wanted to uh, start a business you would go to the national bank you could get uh, a loan there to uh, to start whatever uh, venture that you wanted. So it really did encourage entrepreneurs where it didn't really create that same access for Southerners. So Jackson wants the support of the South, so he vetoes the bank. Without the second national bank, though, there is no regulation of the economy, of money, uh, of the banking system in the United States, and that sets up for the Panic of 1837. In 1836, Jackson is going to leave office and leave his legacy to his Secretary of State, Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren was also the vice president under Jackson in his second term. Uh, but when Van Buren steps into the office, he's immediately hit with the Panic of 1837. This panic was a direct cause of the vetoing of the National Bank because there was no restriction on the state banks. The, we saw speculation on land. We saw easy bank credit to the Westerners. And when you don't check who you're giving loans to and you don't check that they can pay back the money, that means that you're increasing debt. That means the banks are going in, uh, in, the, in the red and that, that is no good for the economy. This panic is going to last for five years. It's going to be the worst depression uh, in the history of the United States. That's why Van Buren is also referred to as Van Ruin. Uh, but even now, and I encourage you to think about this, each president, whatever economy they have, is really a reflection of the president before them, not of their own uh, doings. And, and that travels all the way into the present. Uh, when we look at uh, George Bush's presidency, his economy is a reflection of Clinton. When we look at Obama's presidency, uh, the economy that he inherited comes from the Bush administration. And even traveling into Trump, when you look at the uh, economy that he has benefited from, that can really be traced back to Obama's presidency and the actions that have taken there because the economy takes so long to catch up with whatever actions are put in place. So when we call Van Buren Van Ruin, we really need to look to Jackson and say he was the one that messed up when he vetoed the National Bank, not Van, Buur Van, Van Bruin. Van Buren is going to try to keep the legacy of Jackson intact but uh, by keeping his policies in place, but that only worsens the Depression. It doesn't do any anybody any good. Uh, Van Buren is going to stop all public works and federal aid for internal improvements because internal improvements were seen as a benefit to the North, not of the South. Uh, Van Buren is going to block the annexation of Texas because he's trying to avoid a fight over if we could have slavery in Texas, if we couldn't, and he wants to avoid a war with Mexico, uh, this is going to lead to a very 
poor campaign, uh, very poor support when it comes to 1840. He is going to lose in 1840, uh, and then he's going to lose again under the Free Soil Party in 1848 because he's just a glutton for punishment. So he'll run in 1840, lose. He'll try to run again in 1848 and lose again. Uh, in the election of 1840, you're going to see the eruption of the Whig Party. The Whig Party is going to favor industry, business, education. Uh, in Congress, they'll see, you'll see support for the second bank. You'll see support for a high tariff. And uh, it, really what you see here is the formation of the second party system. Uh, in this election, you're going to see William Henry Harrison, who is a war hero from Tippecanoe uh, from the War of 1812. He will run uh, under the slogan Tippecanoe and Tyler II. Uh, John Tyler is going to be uh, a Democrat, very weak Democrat, but they, they split the ticket here with William Henry Harrison and Tyler to gain the most support, and uh, they will win uh, 234 to 60 in the Electoral College. So you can really see the people's dislike for the Democratic Party there. Uh, uh, Harrison is going to catch a cold less than a month into his office and he's going to die. He's the first to die in office. So Tyler becomes the first vice president to take the office. Uh, he was really only put on the ticket to draw Democrats in to vote. Uh, and, and get the South to vote for this ticket. Uh, it worked uh, for winning the election, but nobody anticipated Harrison dying. So Tyler, when he, uh, he does uh, get into the position of the president, he has to deal with the Whig majority in Congress who try to impeach him but fail. Uh, Tyler is going to be known as the man without a party uh, because he he wins with a, with a Whig and then he doesn't have anybody to support him. So it really is bad news bears for Tyler. Uh, he tries to run as a third party candidate because his own party disowns him in the election of 1844. So he can't run as a Democrat. The Whigs don't want him because they never liked him. So he can't run as a Whig. He tries to run uh, as a third party, but he loses. Uh, he's going to lose to uh, President Polk. Polk goes back to the roots and calls himself a Jacksonian Democrat. He is going to encourage what we call manifest destiny. He is an expansionist. Manifest destiny meaning it is the destiny of the United States to expand from sea to shining sea. Uh, he Polk is going to set his eyes on Texas and Oregon. Uh, he also wants to expand all the way out to California. Uh, Polk knew and is going to support going to war with uh, Mexico. He knows that we're not going to get Texas unless we go to war. And he says, okay, we're ready to go. Uh, he also is going to run on the slogan of 54, 40, or fight. This is going to be a slogan that encourages us to take the lands up uh, north on the western coast, which is now current day Oregon. Uh, he says this with the with the kind of message that he would fight against the British, uh, but he's a big baby behind the scenes, and he knows that we uh, we actually cannot win if we fight the British and if we fight Mexico at the same time. So he really has no intention of fighting the British, but it sounds good, and people really like the idea of him being willing to fight to expand the uh, the meaning of the American dream and expand the United States. We actually uh, negotiate with the British instead of fighting with them, and we settle on the 49th parallel. Um, and the, the other territory that he wants, we do have to fight for, and we'll get to the uh, Mexican-American War very shortly. Uh, but as far as Oregon goes, we don't actually fight for that. We negotiate, which at the time was a much better option. Sectionalism. Now, when I explain sectionalism, this is very simple. When I say sectionalism, it's the same as nationalism, which if I ask you what is nationalism, you will say pride in one's country. Sectionalism is the exact same idea, but it is pride in your section of the United States. So what are our sections? We have the North. 
we have the south and we have the western frontier now they're all going to have different economies in the north you are going to see industry industrial economy in the south you're going to see an agricultural economy and really out west right now uh, as far as economy goes it's really we have no idea we're just trying to survive because the west is such a new frontier we uh, we don't really know what to make work out there yet the social differences between the three are incredible. In the North, you are going to see that very business focused, everybody's going to work outside of the home. You have men, women, children, everybody's working. In the South, you see that uh, d that kind of almost feudal is what I what I liken it to feudal system of social structure where you have your rich white plantation owners you have your yeoman farmers that small farming class and then you have the slaves on the bottom so all of it relating to agriculture really the more land you have the more power you have in the south the more sway uh, the more of a name you build and in the west you see that frontier uh is social structure where it, it really is about survival it's about exploration you're not going to see uh, a whole lot of settling in one place yet it, it you're going to see um people traveling to find uh what works for them uh there's going to be a very different uh agriculture out there because it's not the same lands uh housing is going to be very different you're going to see houses build out built out of these uh soot bricks almost is what it looks like uh and we'll talk about this more at the end of the next unit but know that the west is kind of a a, a country in and of itself it's very different than what we've recognized in the north and the south and it's because it's so new we haven't established what uh what is successful in the west because we we really just got it is what it seems like um but expansion brings about the idea of what do we do with slavery and i want you to keep that issue in your mind as we move forward do we have it in the west do we not have it in the west what do what does uh what because we're trying to figure out what that economy what that social structure looks like the question of the expansion of slavery is really at the forefront for the west sectional issues okay first these are going to be the issues that tear the different sections apart tariffs Tariffs are going to split the North and the South from the very first time that they are passed. The Tariff of 1816, we are going to talk about it, but it is also known as the Tariff of Abominations. It is going to drive the South crazy to see the federal government directly supporting industry because remember tariffs are a tax on imported goods and that does not help the south the south has to import uh much of what it needs to uh function but also if we increase the tariff in the united states there are reactionary tariffs that are passed by europe and that hurts farmers because they export much of their goods so the tariff is not going to be supported by the south another issue the bank as i mentioned before the bank is seen as a crutch to northern industry so the south is again not going to support it the American system, remember Henry Clay with his internal improvements, that is not going to be supported by the South. It's seen as a direct hand uh, to increase uh, trading for the industrial North. It creates higher taxes. The South does not like higher taxes to build what would benefit the North, tearing it apart. Uh, land acquirement, as we expand that question of what do we do with it are they going to support the southern economy and be agriculture are they going to sway to the north and be industrial we don't know but whoever they do side with gives more power so if the west were to become industrial as representation gets added to congress they would support policies that would support industry if the west becomes agricultural they would with their representation in congress support policies that support 
support agriculture. And it's all a numbers game here. The North wants more support in Congress so that laws would be passed to support them. The South wants the same. So the West is really the battleground of these sectional issues. And as I mentioned before, slavery it is rearing its ugly head as we expand the nation. Expansion is wonderful for the United States. When we have more land, we have more power, we're seen as a stronger nation, but it also is twofold. What do we do with it? Do we let this, this uh, institution of slavery expand? When we talk expansion, there are a few big topics that we need to talk about. First, manifest destiny. Put this term in your brain because you are going to need it. Uh, manifest destiny is the idea that it is the destiny of the United States to expand from sea to shining sea, from one side of the United States all the way to the other, uh, eventually the other, I should say, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. I know we say sea to shining sea, that doesn't really make sense. Uh, it should be ocean to shining ocean, but you get the idea, you get the gist. So in order to achieve that, we're going to have a few roadblocks uh, that come up, as you can see in the map, all right? First is going to be Texas. Uh, Texas is going to gain their independence uh, from Spain. Uh, it, the Mexican independence comes in, uh, in 1821. Uh, what we're going to see is Stephen Austin lead 300 Americans to Texas in 1823 because they're independent. Uh, it's not that we take Texas for the United States, but Americans are going to move to Texas to expand. Now, Mexico wants Texas to be a buffer uh, against the Comanche tribe. The American settlers in Texas are, uh, once they get there, they are expected to become Mexican, which would mean becoming Catholic. Now, Stephen Austin, that had led these 300 American families down to Texas, is going to go to the dictator of Mexico, Santa Ana, to negotiate and say, you know, we really don't want to be Mexican. We just kind of want to live here uh, and dwell in the land. Uh, but he, Stephen Austin, is going to be thrown in jail for 18 months for even broaching that idea. In 1835, war is going to break out between Texas and Mexico. By 1836, Texas is going to declare independence from Mexico. Uh, but Santa Ana, the dictator, not a big fan of that. And he is going to send uh, an attack on the Alamo, which is where we get the phrase, remember the Alamo, because this would be a 13-day hold uh, where uh, 187 Texans uh, tried to hold out at Alamo, at the Alamo, and uh, keep the Alamo because they didn't want Mexico uh, to take it. Um, but they're going to be crushed by the Santa Ana forces. But that 13-day hold really proves the strength and the resistance of Texas to gain their independence. Uh, Americans led by Sam Houston are going to go down to help the Texans defeat the Santa Ana forces. By May of 1836, Santa Ana is going to recognize the independence of Texas. Now this leaves a big question mark. What the heck do we do with Texas? Uh, the Texas Americans want to be annexed by the United States, but that would mean trouble uh, with Mexico because that just would mean that the United States helped out the, uh, the Texans to just take the territory. So what the answer then becomes after the Texas Revolution is that Texas is going to remain independent. That is why they are called the Lone Star Republic for the next nine years. The other piece of Manifest Destiny is the Oregon Territory. The Oregon Territory in the picture that you see there is going to be the purple the purple is uh, what had belonged to the British. Now, Oregon had been occupied by the British and the Americans since 1818. Uh, people are going to use the Oregon Trail to travel there at about 15 miles per day in canvas, uh, in canvas uh, caravans to travel. Um, and, and that is crazy, 15 miles a day. Could you imagine? If you guys know me, I come from Buffalo. I travel 62 miles in just one trip. 
and they weren't even doing that in one whole day. That would be days that it would take them. It's crazy. Uh, Polk, when he becomes president, that 54-40 or fight, this is what he's talking about, this land right here. Uh, Polk says he's going to fight, but he knows that that's not going to happen because the British uh, outnumber us in that territory. And eventually we agreed to split the Oregon territory with the British at the, 40, at the 49th parallel. Uh, it looks like a victory for everybody, which is good. Nobody loses. Uh, so that's how we gain that territory, uh, half of that territory in the purple up there that you see. And this brings us to the Mexican-American War. Uh, the old border for Texas had been controlled by Mexico, and I'm going to butcher this name, but it's going to be the Nueces River. Uh, the U.S. is going to want the new border uh, to become the Rio Grande River. Now, Mexico did not want to hear this proposal at all, but the United States is going to propose $30 million to move the boundary to the Rio Grande, uh, and, and we want the New Mexico Territory and, the Calif and California as well. Uh, this is not going to be something that we uh, just get from Mexico. Uh, we're going to have to end up fighting for it. And Polk is going to send Zachary Tyler, Taylor, sorry, Zachary Taylor to move troops to the Rio Grande border. Uh, Mexico is going to attack because they see that as, uh, as an aggressive move by the United States. And then war is going to be declared. Polk is going to take on at full force the Mexicans, and he is going to launch a four-pronged attack against Mexico. And the U.S. is going to be the clear winner here. Uh, Mexico is not a strong nation that we're going against. Their independence in comparison to ours is very fresh. Uh, and and they needed our help to even defend Texas uh, in the first place. Well, they, they, we beat them in Texas in the first place when we go down to help the Texas Americans. So it really is kind of an easy peasy win there. Uh, the U.S. is a, the clear cut winner. We're going to lose about 13,000 men, uh, but the military is going to win the war. The U.S. is going to end up paying uh, $15 million for New Mexico, California, and Rio, and make the new boundary, the Rio Grande, which is crazy. We bought the whole Louisiana territory for the same amount that we bought the Mexican secession. Just nuts. Uh, now, Polk, remember, he's a Jacksonian Democrat. When Polk fights in the Mexican secession, uh, in the Mexican-American War, the, the question is going to become, by the Whigs, did he do this for the right reasons, or did Polk fight this war to expand slavery? So the worry of expansion of slavery from the new group, the abolitionists, who want to push to completely get rid of slavery, uh, comes out at this time. Uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is going to be the treaty that pushes us to get the Mexican secession and the Mexican-American War. And the last piece we need to consider with expansion is the California gold rush. In 1848, flex of gold, and I mean flex, not, we're not finding whole gold nuggets the size of a person. Flex of gold are going to be found in California, which sends people racing to the new territory. In one year, we get 80,000 settlers that move west to these mining towns uh, where the old, and this is going to be where the old west is born. The population is mainly young males, young single males. They're not moving their whole family out there. They're just going to test the waters of what they can find. Um, you're also going to see African Americans, immigrants from Europe, uh, a heavy population of immigrants uh, from China and Mexicans are going to move out to California. This is going to be one of the most diverse populations uh, as far as one place in the United States. Uh, 45,000 immigrants are going to come between 1849 and 1854. So the population just skyrockets in the West uh, and in California because of this gold fever. 
federalism is going to be a huge issue that pushes us towards the war. Now remember, federalism is that idea, the split between the federal and state government rights. Uh, we're going to look at issues with does the federal government or the state government deal with expansion? Uh, is it the state's right to regulate slavery or is it the federal government's right to regulate slavery? The three political parties of the time, the Whigs, the Democrats, and now we see the Republicans coming out are each going to take a separate stance on this. Now, we're not even going to mention the Whigs because they're going to die very soon. Uh, but when we look at the Democrats versus the Republicans at this time, think of it as the exact opposite of how you consider the, uh, the political parties today. The Democrats of this time are going to favor states' rights, heavily favor states' rights. The Republicans are going to heavily favor the federal government, the federal rights. Uh, and the economic differences uh, between the three sections of the United States, we're going to see what kind of federal influence should there be on the economy of these three different sections. Should there be a high tariff that supports the North? Should we take that tariff away? Uh, how do we support the Southern uh, agricultural economy? The the when I look at the Civil War, the main cause is the argument over states' rights. Now, the asterisk that's there is states' rights on the decision of slavery. Okay, so everybody, when you ask them what's caused the Civil War, slavery, yes, but the real cause is was it the state's right to regulate slavery? Section two, I promise I'm going to pick up the pace. Uh, section two, we're doing all the beginnings of the war. We need to look at westward expansion. The beginnings of westward expansion were the Louisiana Purchase. Now, when we got the Louisiana Purchase, we are going to use the Northwest Ordinance to determine how that territory sections off and become states. Go back to the, the lecture previously where we mentioned the Northwest Ordinance and how we blocked that land off if you need more information on that. But when we look at the Northwest Ordinance, that states very clearly that there would not be slavery in the new territories. Uh, but if we continued with that idea, if we didn't allow slavery in all of the new territories, it would then upset the very delicate balance in Congress. Because remember, if you have majority in Congress, say uh, the abolitionists get majority in Congress, they could get rid of the institution of slavery. Say the Southerners get a hold of majority in Congress, they could pass a law that, that kind of cements the institution of slavery. So we are going to go back to this very delicate balance in Congress many, many times. And it is the root of why westward expansion becomes such a huge issue. Uh, Manifest Destiny is going to uh, encourage expansion. That's what we just went over in the last section there. All of the ways in which we expand the country is going to be pushed uh, through the idea of Manifest Destiny. Uh, the Compromise of 1820, the Missouri Compromise of 1820, what we're talking about here is how do we add some of these states to the Union and keep this delicate balance? All right, well, at first in 1820, before we got all of this new territory, because notice in the map, we really only have the orange and the blue and the green. So what happens is the Missouri Compromise draws the line of the 3630 line. And you can see that red line there, okay? And it says above the line, those would be free states. Below the line, those would be slave states, with the exception of Missouri. Missouri would become a slave state, Maine would become a free state, and the line would be there to, to settle any further disputes. But this is pretty much a joke because any of us with some common knowledge can see that above the line there is way more territory to become states than there is below the line, and eventually that line is just not going to work to solve the issues anymore. 
but it plugged the hole for the minute in 1820 because we didn't really uh, look into the future too much, and we solved the problem of Maine and Missouri being added as states to the Union and keeping that delicate balance. Now, I mentioned the tariff before, uh, this tariff of abominations. Uh, the, the tariff of 1828 that's going to be passed by John Quincy Adams is going to be met with the nickname tariff of abominations. And what's going to happen is the state of South Carolina is going to submit the doctrine of nullification. And I talked a little bit about this in the last lecture, so I won't go too much into detail here. But South South Carolina is going to react to the tariff that they believe is harming their economy and protecting the northern economy with the doctrine of nullification stating that states have the power to reject any federal law that they don't like and question the constitutionality of taxes, which this is again the issue of federalism. Who has the power, the states or the federal government? Now, you really as a state cannot just say, I don't really like that tax, I'm not going to pay it. Um, and, and we don't want to force the issue because South Carolina could secede, and this is the first time that we see kind of those uh, mentions of secession. So what is passed is a compromise tariff of 1833, which is to, uh, kind of starts uh, showing us this, this uh, feud between Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, uh, the compromise stops the immediate cause of South Carolina leaving the Union, but would really become a band-aid for a larger issue to come. And the issue that comes up here is, what is your stance on the Constitution? Because the Constitution uh, it explains to us that the states versus the federal government, can what they can and what they cannot do, uh, but the interpretation of the Constitution and on issues like the tariff is what's going to divide the nation moving forward. Other big issues that plant the seedlings to the beginning of the war. Uh, we are going to come uh, have this issue of slavery continue, continue, continue to keep coming up. Now, when the question of slavery in the new ter territories, like the territory we got in the Mexican secession, like what we annexed in uh, from Texas, comes in front of Congress and while the Wilmot Provisio is not going to be passed in 1846, it is huge that this came up. So what is it? The Wilmot Provisio is legislation in the House that boldly declared neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in the lands won in the Mexican-American War. Now, like I said, it never becomes a law because it could not pass while we have this evenly divided Senate, so nobody has majority, but the threat of a law like this coming into Congress illustrated that we cannot upset the balance in Congress because a law that gets rid of slavery could go through. And that is in the mind of everybody. Uh, it, it creates... It is created as a reaction to the Mexican-American War because the North saw the Mexican-American War as a way to expand uh, the way of life of the South. But it really, what we run into when we get that territory is that it doesn't really work. You can't really have these plantations out in that territory because it's just, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, it's also going to be pushed to be passed in retaliation to Polk, who had supported the South when he lowered the tariff and denied funds for internal improvements. The North is going to be out for blood, uh, and they are going to assert themselves because the, the North will not be ignored. Uh, and that leads us right into the election of 1848 and the eruption of the Free Soil Party. Uh, in 1848, Polk is going to be uh, on his way out because he's on his deathbed. Uh, he'll die four months after leaving office, so he's not going to seek re-election. Uh, and that kind of weakens the Democratic Party. Uh, Taylor is going to be uh, one of the 
one of the two Whigs to be elected before the party dies. Um, uh, Zachary Taylor, if you remember, his name came up uh, in the in the uh, Texas Revolution, in the Mexican-American War. He's going to be a war soldier there. And if you know anything about our history, you know that we like war heroes. Uh, the Free Soil Party is going to come out at this time. Uh, the Free Soil Party is is going to be exactly what it is they're going to state that slavery should not extend into the new territories they're going to propose a moderate tariff uh, and internal improvements uh, and a homestead law to encourage people to move out west but what happens when we have three political parties with three people uh, running at the same time that third party is going to draw just enough votes away from the democrats to push a majority for the whig party Party that was running uh, on the slogan of old rough and ready which is one of the worst slogans ever uh, Taylor is going to appeal to the south even knowing he's a Whig because he is a slave owner um, but and he doesn't commit to any side of the issue uh, he's going to die in 1850, and Millard Fillmore another terrible name is going to take over the Compromise of 1850. Now, I told you this was coming because the Missouri Compromise, there was absolutely no way that it was going to survive. So we are now disputing over the new territories that we got in the Mexican-American War, in the Texas Annexation, uh, in getting the Oregon Territory, and in having California. So what the heck do we do with these new territories? Uh, the Compromise of 1850 is pretty simple. First of all, what the North gets in this compromise is California. California becomes a free state. They also get a win when the slave trade is abolished in Washington, D.C. That's huge. Not that slavery is abolished, but the, the trading of slavery uh, is gone. The South, what they get uh, is going to be uh, in the utah and new mexico territories we are going to allow for uh the decision to be made by popular sovereignty remember popular sovereignty all the way back from the first unit is the people's power to vote Okay, the power of the people to decide. So it's not necessarily a win for the South, but it is not a loss for the South because popular sovereignty will be used to decide if they can have slavery there. So the people are going to get to decide on their own. Uh, D.C. is going to have slaves remain there. They're just not going to be importing or trading anymore. And the fugitive slave laws are going to be passed. So if any slave ran away, they would immediately have to be returned. So slaves could not seek safety in the North. They, they would have to be returned. Now, these Fugitive Slave Acts are going to anger many Northerners because now, by law, they are forced to help slave catchers. And this is only going to increase tensions between the North and the South. And many historians are going to argue that the Compromise of 1850 is even less successful than the Missouri Compromise. Let's talk about why. When we talk about the issue of slavery, you guys are going to read about these people for your homework. So I really encourage you to do the readings because I do not have the time to uh, really push a good explanation in the lecture. Um, it, we're going to have some major abolitionists coming out of this time. And the names that you need to recognize, the names that you will read about are Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and Harriet Tubman. Uh, some of these names maybe you remember already, maybe you have not, uh, but I would encourage you to do the reading to find out more uh, about the abolitionists who are pushing to abolish, get rid of slavery in the United States. Now, Harriet Beecher Stowe is going to be a name that we need to remember. This is going to be huge. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe writes Uncle Tom's Cabin to reveal to Northerners who had been living under a rock the atrocities of slavery. 
uh, Lincoln is going to actually, when he meets Harriet Beecher Stowe, say, well, aren't you the little woman that started this great big war? Because she does. When the Northerners read the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, their eyes are glued open to how bad slavery was. Now, many people at this time, they didn't travel, they didn't know what slavery actually was, the reality in the South, how slaves were treated. And when they read about it in print, uh, they are going to uh, get get pushing for this war to get rid of slavery. So Harry Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, one of the most influential pieces that are going to be passed to push for the abolition movement. Now, we need to get to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1954. I just told you, under the Compromise of 1850, the territory in Utah and New Mexico is going to be left open to popular sovereignty. The Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to come from Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois. Uh, it, this is going to be an issue that splits the Whig Party in half. The Northern Whigs are going to absolutely hate what decision is made. The Southern Whigs are going to support it. And once we divide this political party, we are going to see the Northern Whigs become recognized as the Republican Party. Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to open popular sovereignty to the states of Kansas and Nebraska to formally come and vote for if they would like their state to become slaveholding or to outlaw slavery. Uh, the North is going to feel that the Compromise of 1820 was being ignored and they are uh, going to look at the fugitive slave laws of the Compromise of 1850 and absolutely resent them. And when they resent them, they ignore them. And that just leads to more tensions. So when it came time to vote in Kansas and Nebraska, it comes down to Kansas because Nebraska is going to easily outlaw slavery uh, because they can't grow cotton there. So they don't, the people that have settled there don't really see the need for uh, slavery in their state. So now, this goes back to that delicate balance that we're trying to keep. Kansas is, is the one that's up for debate. And Kansas resembles Missouri very much so, which was a slave state. And in order to keep that balance between the free and the slave states in Congress, Kansas would have to become a slave state because Nebraska just outlawed slavery. In 18. 54, 1,700 men from Missouri are going to cross the border into Kansas. They are going to be known as border ruffians. These people are going to threaten anybody who goes to vote to oppose slavery. So, of course, the, the vote is tampered with. Pro-slavery is going to win. But the anti-slavery population in Kansas had outnumbered the pro-slavery numbers uh, in that state. So, Soon, the anti-slavery uh, population is going to form their own government. They are going to be against slavery, and Kansas is going to be a hot-button place. All the while, these border ruffians are coming into Kansas. Uh, President Franklin Pierce, at the time, he's just going to ignore it. Uh, he's going to say, you know what, if I don't pay attention to it, maybe it won't be so bad. Um, and these are really the beginnings of the Civil War. So to have the president ignoring what's happening because he doesn't want to step in the mud is frustrating. And it's going to lead to someone like John Brown uh, going to uh, set up to fight uh, he is going to be uh, anti-slavery. He's going to fight the pro-slavery forces. We are going to see the Potawatomi Creek Massacre here. John Brown is going to lead a midnight attack where five pro-slavery supporters are killed. This elevates the conflict because there had been no bloodshed before John Brown. And now you're going to see tensions rising even more. Hugely important is going to be the Dred Scott v. Sanford State uh, Supreme Court case. 
Uh, this case, Dred Scott had been a former slave. He had been freed uh, when he had moved to a free state with his owner who had died. Uh, but when he uh, takes his case to the courts to prove his freedom, to uphold his freedom, uh, the court actually looks at him and says, you don't even belong in these courts demanding your independence because your property, you're not a person. And this case is essentially ignoring the movement of slaves from, from slave states to free states and ignoring the ability of a quote unquote owner of slaves to declare their slaves free because the laws had not caught up yet. So this case, this case solidifies that slaves are property. It supports the Southerners in their uh, means to keep their slaves. And it really uh, pushes closer to the Civil War because now we know we need laws to declare that slaves are not property that they are people because this case proved that if we don't catch up with the laws, if we don't fight to completely abolish slavery, nobody is going to recognize uh, slaves as people because this case says they are property, not people. The turning points to war. Uh, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in Virginia. John Brown is going to be a martyr for the North because John Brown has this plan to seize weapons from a federal arsenal or a federal stockpile at Harper's Ferry in Virginia. His goal was to start a slave revolt in the South, uh, but after seizing the weapons, Brown and his men are going to be chased into a small building uh, that becomes known as John Brown's Fort. Virginia troops are going to seize the fort, arrest Brown. He's going to stand trial in federal court for treason because he's basically trying to overthrow the government in Virginia. Uh, and to Northerners, Brown is going to be a martyred hero. To Southerners, he's going to be a criminal who deserved his execution, which in the end is what he gets. Um, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts is going to be the Republican Party leader uh, in Congress giving speeches on what had happened in Kansas and how uh, the the anti-slavery voices had been stifled. Uh, he is going to personally attack the South Carolina Senator Andrew Butler, saying that he has chosen a mistress, I mean harlot, and by harlot I'm talking about slavery. His speech is going to go on for two whole days. That's enough to irritate anybody, but it especially irritates a cousin of Butler in Congress, Senator Brooks. Senator Brooks is going to go to visit Charles Sumner and beat him to an inch of his life with a gold-tipped cane until he was physically restrained. He almost killed him. Now, why the heck do I bring this up? I bring this up because this indicates that the violence from Kansas had spilled into the Senate because tensions are growing higher. Lincoln is going to kind of make his debut in a Senate race in 1858. He is going to debate Stephen Douglas. Lincoln and Douglas debate seven times throughout Illinois fighting for the Senate seat. Douglas is going to say popular sovereignty is what we need to decide on the issue of slavery in all of these territories. That is the sacred right of self-government. Doug Douglas is going to support the idea of states' rights, that he believed that the founders had left a legacy to states' rights and that should be upheld. Lincoln is going to point that a house divided cannot stand. That famous quote comes from the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Lincoln is going to argue that the rights of blacks, where Douglas states that the founding fathers specifically did not include blacks, that there should now be an update to the Constitution to include the rights of African Americans. Uh, Douglas is going to win. 
uh, becoming senator of Illinois. So this is a tough loss for Lincoln. But what it does is it solidifies Lincoln's presence on the uh, political stage and will lead to the election of 1860 where uh, Lincoln is going to win. Lincoln is going to be a Republican. The Republicans support the federal government right to decide on issues of expansion, of slavery, of uh, the economy. And this is going to signal Southern secession and the beginning of the war. The conflict. Now, I want to encourage you, if you are super interested in uh, World War II battle history, you have in your wakelet, and I'll go over this in class, there are videos there that will go extensively into detail into the battles of the Civil War. I am going to crush this out in about uh, 10 minutes, so not a whole lot of time, but there is uh, different resources at your fingertips to go into detail into this. When we look at the sectional differences, the North is going to be referred to as the Union. The South is going to be referred to as the Confederacy. Lincoln is going to be the political leader of the North. Grant is going to be his uh, military leader. Jefferson Davis is going to be the president of the Confederacy. Robert E. Lee is going to be the leader of the military for the Confederacy. The strategies are going to be completely different for the North versus the South. The North is going to be using the Anaconda Plan. Okay, the Anaconda Plan uh, is uh, exactly what the picture shows you there. The North wanted to cut off all of the water access for the South because that would essentially dehydrate the Southern economy. The South runs on exports. They have to export their goods. They produce way too much to just sell in the United States. So the Anaconda plan was to stop all exports from the South to other nations, which would weaken their economy and hopefully uh, uh, hurt them enough to lose. This would also cut off their imports. Remember, the industrial centers are in the North. Industrial centers are what's producing the clothes, the bullets, the guns, the cannons, all of what you need to fight a war. So if we can cut them off from exports and imports, then we are going to crush them. Uh, the Mississippi River was what the North essentially wanted to take because if they got the Mississippi River, they would cut the Confederacy in half. And once you divide, you can conquer. Uh, the North also wanted to gain Richmond, Virginia, which would uh, be a center, a capital for the South. And once you get the capital, it's kind of like cap capture the flag, you win. Uh, the strategy of the South was to lie in wait, which, I mean, it depends on how you look at battle history and what you support. But their strategy was to kind of just wait for the North to attack, let them exercise their, uh, their resources to come to us, and then we'll fight them on our own home turf. They also wanted to use what's known as the War of Attrition, which is just like continuous heavy attacks uh, and short bursts against your enemy until they tire out and they... Uh, they go away, they die. Uh, the South also wanted to get Europe on their side uh, in the Civil War, which would have been a disaster. Uh, but Europe basically looks at the United States and is like, we've been there, we've done that, we're not going to help you in this. Uh, but the South thought that because of their trading relationship with Europe that they would be able to get them on their side. And I guess luckily for us that never happened because that would have turned uh, the Civil War into a much darker conflict. When we look at advantages versus disadvantages, the North is going to have greater population. The North is going to have more industrial supplies. The North is going to have a, an extensive and advanced transportation system through their network of trains. Uh, they are going to have the command of the, the brilliant brain of Grant, and they are competing to maintain the Union, to maintain the founding idea of the United States of keeping us the capital U in United States. So that is a big push for the North. 
the South. They are going to have the benefit of agriculture. They are also going to have the brilliant military officer of Robert E. Lee, among others. And they are fighting for the, uh, for the, their way of life, their custom of slavery, they, their, uh, their, their success, what they rest their pride on. So they're standing up for an idea, and that is a factor that cannot be ignored. Turning points. Okay, this is where I say, if you want more battle history, you want to learn more about the extensive fighting of the Civil War, go and watch the video on battle history in your wakelet. Uh, so first, Fort Sumter, 1861. Lincoln is going to try to send supplies to Fort Sumter, which had belonged to the Union but lay in exclusive Confederacy territory. Uh, Davis, remember, Southern President, Confederacy President, is going to order uh, Sumter uh, to be surrendered to the Confederacy from the Union. Shots are going to be fired under the command of general of the Confederate General. General Beauregard against the Union, uh, Major Robert Anderson, and this is the beginning of the Civil War. Anderson is going to have to surrender, surrender Sumter to the Confederacy just three days later because we can't get to it. It is completely surrounded by the Confederates, so we just we it, the Union could not support the battle at Fort Sumter, and this is seen as kind of a first win for the Confederacy. It gives them this false sense of we're going to win this thing. Before the Battle of Antietam, the Confederacy had won, taking Fort Sumter, seizing Frankfurt. This is bad news bears for the Union. Uh, Lee had also won at the first and second battles of Bull Run in the eyes of the Confederacy. This is just, they think this is an easy win. But Antietam turns it around. We see a Union victory there. Lincoln is going to anticipate that this war is going to be short, that this war is going to be quick, few casualties. But after the first battle of Bull Run, Lincoln is going to recognize this conflict as getting out of hand. And he's going to pass legislation to draft one million soldiers for three years. And the Union will then be relentless in their attack, knowing that this is going to be huge. Uh, in one day, 22,000 men are going to fall at the Battle of Antietam, which is crazy, but this paints a solid picture of what the war would become in the United States. Other notable battles that we need to look at, the Battle at Fredericksburg, General Lee is going to face General Burnside. Uh, in one of the bloodiest battles of the war that results in a Confederate win, the battle at Vicksburg is going to represent a Union uh, success here where they gain control of the Mississippi, remember, achieving that goal of splitting the Confederacy. The Battle of Gettysburg, we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about Gettysburg in class together, but this is going to be General Lee's second attempt to invade the North. This is going to be a Union victory, but it comes at a heavy loss. It is going to be the bloodiest battle, lasting only two days of the entire Civil War. You want to talk casualty count? The Union casualties in the battle are going to outnumber 23,000 losses, while the Confederates had lost some 28 thousand men which is going to be a huge hit to both sides here now to rep to show you how terrible this war had become we have to look at sherman's march to sea uh, general sherman is going to lead 60,000 soldiers 285 miles to march from atlanta to savannah and what sherman does is he uses total war and the goal of this total war was to break the morale of the Confederacy. That painting up above is Sherman's march to sea. These soldiers, when they traveled from Atlanta to Savannah, they burned everything in sight. They burned homes. They burned crops. They burned churches. They burned everything that they could see to just absolutely break the South. And this is going to become very important when we're negotiating reconstruction because that's 285 miles of absolute destruction. 
And the South eventually is going to have to try to come back from that. And when you burn, absolutely just burn everything in sight, that is just, it, it looks like the apocalypse. So Sherman's march to see another tactic of the Union against the Confederacy. Now, we got to look at the results. First of all, at the end of the war, we have to have a discussion of what rights do the states have? Do they have the right to secede or leave the Union as the southern states, the Confederacy, actually did? Uh, when the war is over, we look at the Constitution and we say the states don't really have the power to break the national bond as defined in the Constitution. So as we move into Reconstruction in our next uh, lecture for this unit, the Union is going to approach Reconstruction as if the South had never officially broken away. Lincoln also used that same view during his presidency during the Civil War that, yeah, the South may think that they have left the Union, but they really don't have the power to do that. Uh, when we look at uh, the results of the war, we're going to see three reconstruction amendments that are going to become monumental in moving forward from the Civil War. The first, uh, the 13th in 1865, is going to be passed following the war, immediately abolishing slavery. The 14th is going to be passed in 1868, some three years later, and it is going to grant citizenship to find what does citizenship mean in the United States. And what citizenship means is that anybody who's a citizen who's born here has equal protection under the law, which means that no one person based on race, gender, anything like that can be uh, subjected to a different interpretation of the law. Everybody's equal under the law. Every citizen equal under the law. Uh, the 15th Amendment is also going to be passed in 1868. This is going to give all freedmen the right to vote. Now, what's interesting here is that we won't really see that enacted, put into place until 100 years later in the mid-60s. We'll see uh, the, the government pushing to solidify the right to vote. Uh, for African Americans. And even today, when we talked about gerrymandering, when we talk about the reapportion, reapportionment of districts, it is heavily uh, pushing for the oppression of the African American vote. And we can talk more about this in class, but it, it, it just because this amendment is passed does not mean that everybody's going to go out and vote. Um, the status of the North, the North is going to go on to experience a very intense industrial boom. Their economy is going to take off. They are going to do very well. The South, on the other hand, is going to be left in absolute ruins from things like Sherman's March to Sea. Uh, and this stark contrast of who takes off and who gets left behind at the end of the war is going to cause some severe hatred for the North uh, because of their heavy destruction they, they subjected on the South. The South is going to blame uh, the North for their inability to bounce back after the war because of what they did to them. Uh, and the this is going to create some resentment that leads to tensions carrying through for the next it, it few uh, decades. Uh, the South is also going to be blamed for the war. And if you know anything from like World War I last year, uh, when you blame a certain group for the war, that creates even more resentment. Uh, and the South is going to kind of harbor these dark feelings for the North. And that's going to lead us to a dark place when it comes to uniting the nation. But we're going to talk all about Reconstruction in our next uh, lecture. Sorry this one was so long, guys. We'll do Lincoln when we get in person going back to your outline for the week make sure that you submit journal 10 and your unit 5 documents by friday at 11 59 uh, any questions let me know please 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 be sure to do the readings for this week there's a lot of good information in there that uh, will support what you've heard in this lecture